LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com on this New Year's Day 2018. As with previous years, we have an exciting and eclectic lineup of shows planned, and to get things started, my guest today is Mark Ollie, who joins us to discuss the novel The Way of Weird, Tales of an Anglo-Saxon Sorcerer. Written by psychologist and university professor Brian Bates, and published in 1983, The Way of Weird is the story of Watt Brand, a Christian scribe sent on a mission deep into the forests of pagan Anglo-Saxon England, where he finds his beliefs shaken to the core. With Wolf, a wizard, as his guide, Watt is instructed in the magical lore of plants, runes, fate and life force until finally he journeys to the spirit world on a quest to encounter the true nature of his own soul. Although arguably not an entirely accurate depiction of the people, places and events, of Anglo-Saxon England, The Way of Weird speaks to the reader on deep, archetypal and symbolic levels. With each chapter functioning as some form of parable, the novel imparts teachings on psychic and paranormal powers, health and healing, nature and ecology, the human search for spiritual meaning and purpose, and the very nature of life and death. The pagan people of this period had a quite different mode of being and seeing than the techno-industrial consciousness which currently holds sway. It was not so much an either-or mode of thought as an and-also view, more holistic and inclusive, and not so literal, reductionist and coldly rational. It is a view, ironically, which has lately been echoing through the halls of science, where a picture continues to emerge of the world as fundamentally interconnected in ways which often run counter to conventional thinking. Ultimately, the way of Weird's message transcends the limitations of language, and appears as relevant as ever to a species that seems to have lost its way. Hello and welcome, Mark, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you very much. Now, today, Mark, I have persuaded you, roped you in, to talk about a book called The Way of Weird, Tales of an Anglo-Saxon Sorcerer. And this was written by a chap called Brian Bates, uh, published back originally back in 1983. It has undergone a couple of other new, new editions in the meantime. Before we dive into that and why we're talking about that, just tell listeners a bit about who you are and your career and work in general. Okay, uh, my name's Mark Olley. I write um, history books at the moment. I'm probably best known for Revealing the Green Man and the Life and Times of the Real Robin Hood. Um, I've also done a book on the Ninth Legion. Uh, Before that, there's a regional history series um, that I did as a series of books, which was converted into a a television series. So you might have seen me on uh, ITV Granada or Sky History Channel uh, with a series called Lost Treasures um, and a couple of other specials as well. So... That's probably what I'm best known for, although I do uh, tour an awful lot of groups giving PowerPoint presentations, lectures and talks um, over most of the north of England, if not the whole country from time to time. Um, So that's a little bit about me. Okay, well, as I mentioned in my uh, recorded introduction to the show, um, I've talked a little bit about Brian Bates' career and also the basic plot summary of the novel, The Way of Weird. Um, So we don't need to... Uh, worry about that. That's covered. Now, okay. th- this is something, the book I read originally, it came out, as I say, back in 1983, and I read it in 1984. I actually got it 
as part of a book club. I don't know if you ever a member of one of those. Oh, I remember the book clubs. Yeah, yes. in fact, I think my copy's um, book club associates as well. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it could be a bit hit and miss, but they did bring out some nice editions. It was a book that stayed with me um, in the intervening decades since I read it, and it had spoke to me in sort of a archetypal, symbolic, um, almost subliminal level. And it's actually... Although I thoroughly enjoyed the book at the time, and as you said, found something kind of spellbinding about it. As I've got older, as the decades have gone by, ideas, concepts, teachings, things have come up again and again, have re- kind of reminded me of reading that book. And I think it kind of opened a bit of a, a portal in my mind, if I can put it that way, in my consciousness. I Just, think that's what the writer was aiming for. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, it's a book that you've had on your shelf for some time, but it was only when yes. I... So when I asked you if you had the book, you said, yes, but I haven't read it. You then kindly went off and read it. And again, you took a certain number of things away from it. And as you rightly say, what I've just mentioned is what the author was intending. And uh, we don't have to take this book by any means as somehow historically accurate. Uh, it was interesting because, I, 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 like I say, I've, I've had the book a while, but it, it's good because I'm coming to it new. I'm coming to it sort of now in 2017. I'm um, coming to it as a, a sort of a completely new experience. And uh, I read it thoroughly from cover to cover and uh, found myself somewhat divided uh, by it. Um, the the archaeologist historian in me uh, was sent screaming <laughs> because there's all kinds of things in it. I, I found myself reading it thinking, oh, it would never have happened like that or mm. they would never have done that. That's not what it was like and... But then the other half of me, as someone who's very much sort of in touch with the environment and with magic and things around us, that part of me was like, oh, actually, you know, I quite agree with some of the things in this. Uh, I think I came out at the end of it in that respect, feeling very much as yourself, that what he's done, he's fictionalised something, and he's tried to bring in as much of the Anglo-Saxon uh, history and background that was known at the time. So obviously he's basing his researches on material that will go back into the 1970s. So we've come a long way since then. Um, he's obviously done that, but he's fictionalised it. He's brought it forward as a fictional story. Um, and in doing that, he's then communicating the real message, the background message that's sort of contained in the book. Um, so that's sort of how I ended up. I got to the end of it and I thought, oh dear, <laughs> that's really sent me in two different directions, that. Um, so I would say, I mean, if anyone wants to go out and read it, I would say, you know, don't sort of take it literally, don't sort of read it and think, oh, is this really what they did in the Anglo-Saxon times? Because it is a work of fiction. It does state that very clearly. Um, you know, and it's it's more akin to what they might do in the African bush than what they might do in Shepherd's bush, you know, in the Anglo-Saxon times. Um, but at the end of the day, the message behind it is still very clear, and I think it's still very relevant for today. Well, I suppose it, it was kind of a form of modern mythology in a way, because so many myths that uh, you know weren't always meant to be regarded as you know, a factual account of events or people or places, but equally they weren't just completely made up, but they kind of had a function somewhere in between, and it was also somehow transcendent. They were meant to convey something that was perhaps difficult to say in a straightforward manner. In a, in a biblical sense, I yeah. think that's a parable. You're referring to a parable, which is a story that communicates a truth. Um, and almost certainly, I would say, the way, the way of weird, every chapter is, as such, a parable. It's communicating something about the environment around us. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, Brian Bates was a psychologist, um, but had a deep, obviously, concern about the lessons that we could learn from the past. A deep concern about where we're headed as a species, I suppose, and that perhaps we had um, prematurely abandoned a lot of the ancient wisdom, and this is something that perhaps we should try and reintegrate not as a way of like somehow going back to a past which is you know just unattainable but but looking back to move forward just to you know bring this adapt this wisdom to, in order to you know shine a light on a, a future path for us in his uh, preface uh, Bates himself says I'm quoting here the teachings of, of the way of weird are as potent and challenging today as they were a thousand years ago they have implications for our notions of life and death psychological and paranormal powers health and healing ecology and the contemporary search for spiritual meaning in life 
For me, this is typical of the things that he says in his kind of commentary that's in his own book, which is about his own book. And he's basically quite boldly stating what we've just been saying, that this is the message of my book. This is why it is important. Before he dives into the the sword and sorcery fantasy world that he presents in the narrative. Well, it's it's interesting because I... The bit that I sort of agree with, if you like, which is well and truly in that particular ballpark, is the idea that the the main two characters, you have one character who's basically chosen a religious path of detachment, and one character that's chosen a religious path of connectivity, which, in a sort of way, gets to the root of one of the gripes that I've always had about European magic and British magic and um, whichever path you choose in that respect. And and that is the fact that if you pick, for example, a path that is from somewhere else other than where you live, then you can only adopt it. The practice of it won't resonate with the sense of place. It won't fit well with where you are. On the other hand, if you then chose a religious path that has in the past developed and is appropriate to where you live, you're in with a better chance. You're already off to a better start than picking something that comes from elsewhere. Um, And one of my biggest gripes with a lot of the paths that people tend to practice is they develop something, they practice something that doesn't actually sit with where they are. Um, For example, I live in the north of England, So it would be obvious for me to try to pick something, magically or whatever, that has happened in the north of England, something that sits very well. Um, Perhaps the best example, by far and away the best example, uh, of stuff that sits with people that live certainly in the middle, if not going up into the north of England, uh, is is the Arthurian material. We're all drawn to the matter of Britain because it has its origins here in the British Isles. Back to the way of weird, I mean, the Anglo-Saxons were here. So the story he paints and the locations he uses in that book are centred here, here in the British Isles. And that's one of the real big, major, overarching themes of the way of weird, uh, where you've got this sort of monk character who's practising what in Anglo-Saxon times was something that in the previous thousand years had drifted to Britain across Europe and from the Middle East. Obviously, it had altered and adapted and changed and become very, very Celtic by the time it arrived here. But by the same token, what the actual Anglo-Saxon practitioner was practicing was straightforward ancient European shamanic magic, which belongs very much in Britain and Europe, uh, where we are. So you can almost see right from the very beginning that that is something that, that, that Brian's trying to get at in his book. He's trying to say at the very beginning... For goodness sake, you know, if you're going to dash out there and try and connect with your environment, you know, and practice sort of, you know, something where you live, if you live in Britain, for goodness sake, pick something that's British, (laughs) you know, um, fairly obvious, really. Uh, But that's what I came out with the impression of, certainly. Very early on in the plot, you've got this uh, dichotomy between the two characters, one of whom is practicing the imported religion, and the other one, obviously, a religion that sits very well and fits with the society that he's in. So that, I mean, it's that alone, that single point alone validates the way of weird because it's a point that everyone should take to heart. You know, no, there's no point following some magical or mystical guru that, that has no connection whatsoever with where you live. It just, it's not going to sit right. It isn't going to work. You're never going to arrive at your full magical and spiritual potential. You're not going to connect with your environment if you're practicing something from, you know, India or Africa, or America, or wherever. Whatever path you choose has got to sit somehow with the place that you find yourself in. Mark, you've said something really, really important there. Uh, One of the central takeaways from the book, and we'll return to that shortly. Just before we move on, for people who are not perhaps familiar with the background to this, whether it's with regard to the book or not, from your own perspective, maybe you could set the scene a little bit here about the Anglo-Saxon period, Sometimes part of it referred to as the so-called Dark Ages. 
I mean, are we, <laughs> we're loosely talking about maybe from the middle of the 5th century through to the Norman Conquest. I mean, we're just trying to fi- say something a little bit about what the British Isles were like at that time. I mean, we could do a whole show on sort of uh, how everybody lived <laughs> and what they did, but just a little bit, just to g- give people a flavour of the background to, to what we're talking about here. Okay, well, um, I will take a modern day view of this because it was always believed uh, in the past that when it came to the end of the Roman period, that somewhere between, say, 410 and 415 AD, that the Romans just literally packed up, you know, put all the villas in a suitcase, got on a boat and sailed back home to Italy. Uh, Well, that just didn't happen. That kind of evacuation of the country didn't happen. What happens is, in the 400s and the 500s, you've got a tail-off. There's a kind of 200-year um, decline, if you like, in Romanization. It starts to break down. And what you see in that period, obviously in the middle of that, you've got King Arthur. The whole Arthurian thing, either side of 500 AD, sits in that period. And that clearly shows you what happens as it transforms itself from Roman back into a sort of Celtic Britain-type situation it devolves back into a tribal society and then in the middle of all that there's a few anglo-saxons over here that were already here when the romans were here they came over as mercenaries and the anglo-saxons are kind of sat here thinking well hang on a minute we've just all, all the soldiers and everything associated with rome has effectively moved out and we've now got lots of space the country had lots of uh, areas of space The Romans cleared a lot of the country, took away a lot of the woodland and things to build um, farms and to create, you know, the sort of agrarian, you know, economy they needed to keep people alive. Um, So there was all this space. So basically the Anglo-Saxons started sending messages home to say, you know, if you're short of a bit of space, come over here. Why not come and join us? So I'm assuming, and it's a very informed assumption, that the first Anglo-Saxon settlers rather than invaders probably started drifting across here either side of 600 AD. Certainly by 700 AD the archaeology is showing that the Saxons are settled here in proper serious communities. Probably one of the most significant things from archaeology is, is the uh, the east coast. All the way up the east coast from Roman times seems to have been largely inhabited by Saxon settlers. So they weren't completely unknown they were sort of here from pretty much from the Roman period right on. Um, the Saxons then don't really start to fizzle out till, well, 1066. You know, the argument is that, you know, Harold who was at Battle of Hastings and that was of Saxon descent. The nobility were the Saxon. So essentially they grew in numbers till they, somewhere between seven and 800, took control of the country. The only real threat was a very, very, very similar culture, which is the Vikings, the Danes, the Scandinavians, the Norwegians. They're coming over, and they're a lot more aggressive. They're very similar to the point where, in some cases, you can't actually tell the difference where they're settling and what they're doing. They don't leave any traces in the archaeology. And within two or three generations, they kind of marry into the Saxons. They start to disappear from areas where you know very well that they're there, but they just go into the background. So really, the way of the weird is set in a a period of time where all of that has happened. So the primary, I suppose, English, Anglesh, Anglo-Saxon, Anglans and Saxons mixed together, um, that period is probably from about 600 running through to about 1000. So you've got a period of 400 years there where they've settled and taken root. So that's really the period you're in. It sits before the Vikings, which makes it unusual. Um, as I say, they were very similar in culture. They had sagas, they had runes, they had mythology, they had ways of building and ways of doing things. And when the Vikings came over, they didn't entirely obliterate them. So uh, the period the book is set in is, I would imagine, having read it, somewhere towards 1000. So it's before 1066, it's before the Normans. Uh, they've had a few scraps of the Vikings because there's a, a strong hint in the background that there's that sort of warlike tribal thing is really settled in between uh, Saxons and Danes. Um, but that's that's where we're at. So things have things have changed. But you've still got all that corpus of Arthurian material. There's still a lot of Celts knocking around, the Scots, the Irish. Uh, they're all still around as well. It's just broken down in, into um, social groups 
rather than one coherent, everybody belongs to the same club kind of mentality. Uh, it's gone back to being quite separate, which is where you get things like all the separate Saxon kingdoms from, Middlesex, Sussex, Wessex. They're all, you know, separate kingdoms, but at the same time all run by Saxons. And that's the period we're in here, I think. Now, I wanted to say a word about this concept, this idea of weird itself. Uh, just before I do that, is your understanding that the weird of the book links literally and, and directly to the word that we have today? Oh, that's weird. Wow, that's a difficult question. Um, <clears throat> bearing in mind that Brian Bates, when he wrote the book, was trying to get back to the origins. So he's using a lot of the original Anglo-Saxon literature to try to tease out from that surviving literature enough to show where their magical mind was at, if you like. He's trying to get what little information has survived and try and make something of it. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind historically that when the Vikings took control, which basically translates as Normans, they absolutely hated the Anglo-Saxons. So an awful lot of stuff that would otherwise have survived didn't make it past 1066. As soon as you get to the end of the 1000s to the beginning of the 1100s, an awful lot of Anglo-Saxon material has been destroyed and it's been built over by another culture. So it's very difficult to get that original material. So for somebody to be able to say, does the weird of the book link to the weird of today, I think we've dug up more material than Brian had available back in the 1970s. I think we've, we've found a few more threads and we've made a few more discoveries. Um, but it's going to have a lot of similarities with the stuff that Brian's got in his book because you've only got the same body of material to rely on to move it forward into modern times. I suppose the real question is, is it as relevant now as it was back in Anglo-Saxon times? That's, that's the real question. As I took it away from the book, and I say it took me a few years, because I was quite young when I read it, it took me a few years to kind of assim yeah. assimilate the idea uh, in my subconscious, was that the idea of weird was sort of a force that permeates everything. And this relates to a number of different things that people who haven't necessarily looked into these things may have somehow grasped or semi you know, intellectualized from popular mm. culture. A uh, one that I always like to go back to is the concept of the force in Star Wars, because <laughs> almost everybody will be expo exposed to that on some level. And yeah. all the mystical element of Star Wars is all connected with the force, you know, something that underlies all of existence, all reality. But the, the, the weird of the, of Brian's book goes back to a time when things were not so literal myth and magic had a reality to them that has been was stripped away subsequently that many people were still interconnected with each other and with nature in a way that again was lost the romans kind of adopted into their own pantheon almost every god or goddess that they came across the problem they had with the druids is the druids were telling everyone to kill romans <laughs> which is a fairly basic problem when you're trying to conquer a culture. Uh, right to the very end, the Druids were telling people to kill the Romans, right till they'd actually succeeded in driving them out. Um, so that was the problem they really had. Um, they were more like religious dissidents. They were, you know, the invaded minorities resistance party on a religious level. So the Romans really had problems with them. Um, but that can be taken away from it can be separated from the gods and goddesses that they worship because they were still as far as the romans were concerned gods and goddesses that demanded respect and we we find that archaeologically every shrine that you run across every roman reference that you find tends to adopt or absorb something very much the same as what was there before in some cases the same as what was there before so and and again the the idea of Star Wars and what they have with the Force and the idea of weird is slightly different in that you've almost got cause and effect. I think with the Star Wars thing, it's very science fiction -y, very modern. You know, we've had the whole thing with the being supreme deities and supreme gods and, and we're aware of that as a concept. Some people even think it's aliens that are behind everything, but you've got this idea that there is actually a force behind everything. 
Whereas in the way of weird, what they're saying is that, whoa, hang on a minute, scale this right down. What happens when you walk down the street every day? You know, you don't sort of bump into God and you don't bump into an, an incarnation of the force. What you bump into is, you know, next door's cat, the crows that are sat in the tree next to you, you know, the tree, the grass, the ground, the weather, you know, the magnetic force and energy that's here mechanically in the earth. So what you've done is you've almost pulled back a level, you've separated it. And, and in the way of weird, he's saying, you know, no matter who's behind it all, no matter who created it all, no matter what's there, which is the monk's view, he's sort of going down that route and saying, oh, hang on a minute, there's this big thing behind it all. What the actual shaman is saying is, but that doesn't make any difference to you living on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you start to walk out your front door of your hut, you still have to walk across the ground under your feet, you still have to experience whatever the weather's got to throw at you that particular day. And what the shaman is saying is that, that environment, that is where the magic is, that's where the power is, that's where the force is, that's the sort of thing you can make use of, which is my understanding of weird, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So it's, it's slightly different, it's a slightly different view. That again is this idea of putting a monk against a shaman. The historical background is very clever, but the religious background is equally clever. Um, and it's still true today that those who practice magic and those who follow the shamanic path are still trying to communicate and they're still trying to win over the Christian religious establishment. They're still trying to say, hang on a minute, we've got something valid that you guys need to know about. That's still going on. Hence, it appears in the way of weird. Well, that was my understanding of it anyway, as I got sort of further and further through the book. You mentioned the Arthurian aspect to this, the myths and legends, and whatever historical connections there might be to any of those tales. And I, I read The Way of Weird before, not very long before, but I think just before I saw John Berman's film of Excalibur. Um, oh, yeah. Which is another one of those things where diabolical liberties no doubt but the point is it's you know the the film speaks on this like um archetypal symbolic level and it's very powerful and it's like you could you can enjoy it just as complete entertaining nonsense if you want the point is it, it, it lives on it has like this book it has something about it some kind of flavor some kind of color some kind of resonance that just stays with you when i saw excalibur i thought back to the way of weird and in excalibur there's merlin's reflecting on how their world is changing and oh, yes. he says at one point, the days of our kind are numbered. The one God comes to drive out the many gods. The spirits of wood and stream grow silent. It's the way of things. Yes, it's a time for men and their ways. And I was reminded of Brand, the monk in the way of weird, yes. arriving at his destination to meet his guide, who turns out to be Wolf the Shaman. And of course, Brand believes he's arrived in some kind of barbaric wasteland, even though it's probably just a couple of hundred miles down the road. He's considering all the silly superstitions of, of these local people, but also he's afraid. There's no question about it. So he's somehow um, sardonically condescending, but also terrified. I, I just remember those two things happened in my life, uh, Excalibur and The Way of Weird. They happened within 12 months of each other. Wow, gosh, that's quite a, a clash of ideologies, that theory, me. Yes. Um, in, in a sense, in a sense, um, Excalibur is correct in its betrayal, um, because ultimately, as we know from history, the one god, as it were, appears to have triumphed over the many. But there is a third element. There is actually a third element in the book, because I think the monk in the book starts to get won over. He starts to change his view when he realises that the shaman's way of doing things works in practice. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. That's the third element, because it's fine sitting in a church and hearing everything in theory. It's fine reading books, reading everything in theory. But I think where we came in right at the beginning, it's all to do with what happens when you start to do things in practice. And I think the practical abilities that the Saxon shaman had in the way that he puts things into reality and makes things actually happen, and therefore appears magical, because obviously his knowledge enables him to do things that other human beings can't, that wins the whole 
sort of it, it wins over, it triumphs over the monk's um, preconceived ideas. You know, the monk can then see that what the shaman is doing works, you know, in practice. Mm-hmm. Whereas he hasn't got anything to offer in practice. Actually, he's a bit of a numpty in the story. I was reading it thinking, I'm not really sure that, you know, a monk would be this naive in medieval times. I think he would probably know at least something more than uh, than he does as a character. But then by his own admission, the abbot has actually sent him to on this assignment to learn. Mm-hmm. So he, he, there's, there's that third element. The third element is, well, does it work or doesn't it? Because there's, there's no point... I mean, to give an absolutely primary example, you know, somebody gets hold of the Bible, they flip it open, Jesus walked on water, so they go, you know, legging down to the local canal, and much to their surprise, they sink when they try <laughs> to walk across. You know, it, it, no matter how good the theory is, you know, this book, The Way of the Weird, seems to be where the rubber hits the road. You know, it's this is what you're doing on a day-to-day level, and these are the things you come up against. Um, you know, so it's... That's a third element as well worth bearing in mind, especially when reading the book. Yeah, well, what you were just saying about the practicality of, of that which worked reminds me on the prevailing Christian attitude towards nature anyway, which is, you know, it's to be ruled and dominated and exploited, and it's all God's creatures, you know, are put there for the benefit of mankind. At best, Christianity and other, you know, Abrahamic religions appear somewhat ambivalent about the environment and ecology and there's a separation from and fear of nature that we are of course a totally embedded part of so there was always that strange dichotomy going on and i think that's what brand once again the monk comes up against with wolf the shaman it's the christian idea that well it it sort of came in as a bit of a heresy in medieval times it's the christian idea that physical things and physical objects and things that are physically around us are intrinsically evil uh, which, of course, isn't true, and it's not biblical either. Uh, but there's still an awful lot of people around today that's, that still sort of hold to that nominally. And as you rightly say, the the way that physical reality and the physical world and creatures have been treated um, has been negative as a result of that. Um, but it's, it is a heresy. <laughs> it's not the way it should be. And there's also something that comes across a little bit in the way of weird, or I should say it just reminds us of the attitude to female power, female energy, uh, to women in general. And we think about the established church and kind of, you know, the later witch hunts and the earlier, I wouldn't say matriarchal societies, but maybe, you know, matri focused or something like that. And how Christianity changed that. There was a marginalization of female energy, female power that is still kind of very much latent in um, the society as presented to us in the way of weird. In fact, there are even a few incidents in the books, aren't there, where, where Brand, the, the monk, is kind of, there's a bit of tension there, kind of like, because, of course, the, the type of lifestyle that he's signed up for doesn't involve contact with no. you know female contact. But you can see in, in Wolf's world, it's very much, a, a, you know, it's earthy, in all sorts of ways, it's, it's physical, it's uh, immediate. It's Well, in Anglo-Saxon and Viking archaeology, now more particularly, with the advent of DNA, we can find out what bodies are buried in which graves. And they're getting some real surprises now because some warriors, in inverted commas, that have been assumed to be, you know, strapping males um, probably for over 100 years or more um, since they, they were first excavated, uh, DNA is now showing that, that they're actually ladies. You know, they're um, definitely playing on the same level as the men. Uh, there are female warriors in Saxon society and female warriors in Viking, Danish, Scandinavian, Norwegian society as well. Um, and they're buried with high honours. Uh, the one that springs to mind, I think I'm right in saying, is the Gokstad ship, which they have over in Oslo in the museum there. Uh, that was kitted out with everything you could possibly imagine, buildings, chariots, sleighs, all sorts. But the body underneath the house in the centre of the ship was a queen. Mm-hmm. It's a queen's ship. So I think you're right in saying that. The measure of equality found in the Saxon society, that's the background to the book, that equality is, is more so than ever is found subsequently in sort of medieval society and beyond. Um, as you say, the woman takes more and more of a back seat as, as time moves on. Not entirely, though, because there were still female Saxon warriors till relatively late in history. 
uh, I dare stick my neck out and say there's probably a few actually fighting at Hastings. Um, but, you know, it's it's with the Normans and the progression of chivalry um, that it all changes. OK, just reflecting on what you said a moment ago about separation and kind of breaking things down, especially with regard to, to nature and, and the general you know, that Christian attitude to the natural world. Uh, there's one point in the book that is very memorable for me, and it's when Wolf is talking to Brand about herbs and plant medicine. Because at one oh, point, yeah. uh, Brand hurts his ankle really rather badly, just been, like trekking through the countryside. And of course, he's trying not to say anything about it because he doesn't want to appear weak and, and stupid. But when they're looking, you know, at some point, Wolf says, OK, we need to find this, this and this. And he's talking Brand through this stuff. And of course, Brand is trying to understand things from what was very much an emergent, materialistic, reductionist, scientific point of view. It's like, you know, what is this? What is it? You know, and there's value to that way of looking at things. But Wolf says to him at one point, do not label them. Just get to know them. And this is what he's talking yeah. He's talking about plants here. Yeah. And that yeah. Is, there's great value in that statement. And, and this also reminds me of other elements of the book where, you know, symbols represent multiple levels and things that cannot be spoken or understood in terms of just language, you know, just the limits of language in general. And we touched on that a little earlier on, didn't we? It's interesting. Um, the more we've learned through the wonders of science, the more we've almost come full circle and gone back to where this book actually is, where the world around us, we're learning about balance, we're learning about harmony, we're learning about the connectedness of all things, how all things interact. Um, we're also learning, thankfully, to get rid of our assumptions. I think we came out of the Victorian era, the industrial era, with, with a huge amount of baggage of assumptions about things. Um, I mean, perhaps uh, I'll use an example. Biggest example is trees. Everybody automatically assumes that a tree is made of wood. Now, that is a fact, and it's a perfectly scientific fact, but actually they're not. Trees are some of the oldest, if not the oldest, living creatures on planet Earth. And the more we've looked at trees, the more we've understood that they communicate and that there's a neural net in there and that they go below ground and do all sorts of things, that there's, there's more going on perhaps in the roots even than there is in the branches. They're absolutely phenomenal. You know, they filter the air. They, they sustain an entire ecosystem. The more we've looked at them, the, de the way of describing a tree as a piece of wood is inadequate. It's woefully inadequate. Um, that's just one example. And scientifically, what I've told you now is a prevailing scientific view that these things are living entities, that they have almost, or we're almost at the point where we can detect feelings in plants. You know, we know what music does to them. We know what uh, violence does to them. I think that's possibly the point that we were at at the beginning of the 1980s, that that sort of um, consciousness about the living entities around us, that started to come forward through science. So we've almost gone back to actually discovering that what the shaman is saying is actually true. But not enough people really appreciate that. If more people appreciated that, we wouldn't be hacking down the Amazon rainforest the way that that's going, or knocking trees down because they happen to get in our way over here. It changes your view. And again, to really stretch it, I think possibly where the monk and shaman meet at the end of the book, I think they both come down with the same view that all the stuff that's around them that's created is all connected, and ultimately all connected to whatever God with a capital G or gods with a small G and goddesses with a small G, whatever they are, that super consciousness flows through it all. And that's sort of where the book seems to take you towards the end. It's saying, you know, watch out because this is all, everything is fragments of the divine. You know, you shouldn't be treating them as, as well, in the way that we do, you know. Um, that's a very clear message, I think. And you come away at the end of the book thinking, yep, that is, you know, we live in little boxes, we like to think we rule the world, you know, etc., etc. And we don't, we shouldn't. We shouldn't just be connected to, you know, our walls, our floor, our ceilings, you know, the chair we're sat in. So we really do need to get out there and connect with what's out there, because there's a load of stuff out there. It's a huge voyage of discovery. You know, I'd go even further and say, instead of firing objects out into space at targets out there, we should be focusing perhaps a lot more on what we actually have down here 
and looking more and more closely at what's going on on planet Earth. And I think we'd have some surprises. I think we would change our attitude and perhaps, as is often the way, discover that the ancient way of doing things, the old way of doing things, was actually right all along. Maybe not for the reasons they thought, but, you know, maybe they are the right, uh, the right way to go. Yeah, I think the biggest nervous system in the world, I remember reading about this, I think it's, a, again, a system of trees, interconnected trees, uh, somewhere in North America. And yes, I was going to say America, the, because the trees have been allowed to grow wild, mm -hmm. um, and they've all connected up, haven't they? Yeah, I can't remember I think, where it is. Think, it might be in one of the national parks, but it covers a staggering area in terms of acres, and it, this thing is kind of, on some levels, it is functioning as, as one entity, shall we say, one being. It is. I think that's where they got the idea for Avatar from. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that all the plants and animals in that particular science fiction story are all connected in a similar way. I seem to remember there was a connection there. Uh, but yes, it is. I think trees are, are, are pretty much the front runner at the moment because we've, we've actually spent some time looking at them and studying them. And they are actually representing now, if you like, the same things that apply to the rest of the, the plant kingdom. Um, and possibly, possibly, dare I say it, to the animal kingdom as well. There seems to be a connectedness, um, and we've sort of stepped back and detached and cut ourselves off. Um, back again to the book, The Way of Weird, that's saying don't do that. It's saying quite the opposite, connect, you know, because that's what a weird is, connect, learn, observe, you know, become a part of. You might have to live in a house, but you don't have to stay in the house. You can go out, you can connect. Uh, I think that's really uh, one of the enduring themes of the book. Close to the top of the hour, you mentioned something about a sort of a spirituality, um, a magic, a mysticism, whatever, of place. Um, yeah. Something of, you know, that was located and that was relevant. And I did say I would bring this up again. Where we are in the, our conversation brings me back to that again in the sense that there was a point when Eastern mysticism became fashionable and favoured in the West, particularly, I think, in the 50s and 60s, being popularized for a Western audience by people like, like Alan Watts. And there was a whole series, yeah. series of others, the Beatles going to India, you name it. Yeah. And yeah. that, that any sort of indigenous European or pagan or Nordic or whatever happened to be kind of spiritual belief system became just very unfashionable for, um, for all sorts of reasons. That, that point you made is very, very powerful, and that's definitely one of the, the major messages of The Way of Weird, I think, is the relevance of that. So it's worth mentioning just how we got as a society, why, you know, our, in our spiritual life collectively, how we got where we are now, just remembering that the Eastern influx. This is to say nothing about the value or otherwise of Eastern belief system or a belief system for anywhere else on the globe that has inherent value. It's just about relevance and application to people and place and time and what have you. So yeah. the basic, there was no particular reason that, that this wholesale Eastern mysticism needed to somehow supplant um, a Western tradition or any more reason why the Western belief systems would have been exported wholesale to the east i'm looking at it from a sort of practical almost pragmatic point of view because you can in, in your mind's eye you can almost imagine you've got somebody who's a teenager let's say and they're following you know um let's pick a one at random it doesn't have to be any let's say they decide oh yeah tibetan buddhism that looks interesting i'm gonna have a bash at tibetan buddhism so they dash out into the back garden with a how to do tibetan buddhism book and all the necessary paraphernalia, they dash out into the back garden and they sat there and they're thinking, this isn't working. Why is nothing happening? Why am I not getting a buzz out of this? You know, why, why is, is, is nothing going the way it's supposed to go? Well, if you're an absolute expert, if you're a visitor over here from Tibet and you happen to be one of the, you know, Dalai Lama's right-hand men, you're going to take your religion with you and go anywhere and it isn't going to be a problem. If you're a complete and total novice and you dash out into your back garden expecting it to work, well, for a start, you're going to freeze to death if you sat out there with no hair and saffron robes. You know, it just isn't going to work. On the other hand, the same person could get hold of the way of weird, have a read of that and think, oh, I'll tell you what, let's have a bash at something like old school witchcraft. Let's pull out an old school witchcraft book and, and have a look at that. A lot of that's European. There's a lot of European stuff based in it. So they get all the stuff, the paraphernalia, the how-to-do junior witchcraft books. They dash out into the back garden, and lo and behold, it works. Now, the 
first assumption anybody makes when that happens is, oh, well, there must be power in all things. Everything's bound to work. You know, this has worked, therefore everything else works. But I'm not actually saying that any one particular religion is better than any other. Um, over the many years that I've studied many different paths, I believe that there is power and energy in them all. They all have something to offer. They all bring forward a particular strength. But let's face it, at the end of the day, most people, 99.9% .9 of people, will start at the point that they find themselves. They will begin a spiritual path at their local site, wherever they happen to be. Now, most of it, round here in the north of England, we tend to literally head for the hills. You find a big hill, you go up to the top of the hill, you sit there, you watch the sunset, you enjoy the view, the moon comes out, you have a little fire, you toast marshmallows, off you go. That's sort of the level of the first contact that people in this part of the, the world have with the natural environment. They watch the stars come out. But that's the way of weird. What they're actually doing is the magic that is appropriate for them as a biological entity, because that's where 99% of the time they were born or they grew up, and also for the place where they are, the sense of place, the location, the surroundings. They're plugging in, turning on, tuning in becoming a part of, of where they are. So there's a lot to be said for shooting for what's appropriate for where you are and where you're at. Some of the other things, I've had many people come to me over the years and say, oh, you know, I followed Buddhism, I followed Islam, I was a Hindu or, you know, uh, Christianity, I thought that might be for me, and, but I didn't like sitting in a stuffy church all day on Sunday, you know, I just didn't connect with it. Hundreds of people have said things like that. But that's not where I would say start. I would start pretty much where this book begins. I would go out into the environment and become a part of where you are and what you are. That's, that's really the beginning, isn't it? That's the, the start of reaching out, you know. Um, it almost eliminates the necessity for that debate, is there a God? It eliminates that completely. It removes that as a, as, as, as a necessary issue. Because if you go out and you connect you connected with whatever it is that's out there. You don't have to answer the question because you're experiencing. You're actually experiencing something. The world, the environment, or possibly, ultimately, the divine is giving you a first-hand sense of experience of something that actually works. And, and that sort of was where I was going, I think, at the beginning with what I was saying. Um, and the way of weird is fab, because it kind of points you in that direction. That's the background to it, that's what I really took away from it. I thought, you know, maybe the fictional side, the historical side, the archaeological side, it's, it's not entirely correct. But the point he's trying to make, that connectedness, that, that really, if the way the weird I could sum it up, I would just say, that's what it's about, connectedness, about where you are, who and what you are, you've just got to connect. Towards the end of the book, Brand asks Wolf, he can he kind of condescending scoffing way uh, would you prefer if giants still ruled the land and, and wolf kind of very calmly replies they will again it's the way of things they move they move in cycles and this kind of reminds me perhaps where we are now perhaps where brian bates felt that we were going or needed to be the elements of weird or you know as he would have had it anglo-saxon sorcery and mysticism still live on in a fragmentary form but they're Currently undergoing what I mentioned earlier, you know, quite a, a dramatic resurgence and renaissance. And that includes these ideas in the forms that they take in other parts of the world, not just in this particular localized, you know, what works for, for Europe. Well, I think all of the writings that have occurred down the centuries um, and have survived, anything that we can find perhaps, you know, obviously translated to whatever language we speak today, I think there's something in all of those that offer us an insight um, into where we can be and where we can go and what can happen. I think we ignore that at our peril. I don't think we can say that the past has nothing to offer and that it's all about new stuff and new experiences. I don't think that's the case. I think we have to temper everything we do knowing that we are standing on the shoulders of giants, back to giants again. Um, there are people who have gone before us, entire races of people who have gone before us that have developed spirituality 
um, in many different ways, and we benefit from their their um, hindsight, their experience. We benefit from that. So I'm not necessarily saying that the only way forward would be just purely to experience. But again, it's sensible to sort of start where you are as opposed to trying to start where somebody else was, if that makes sense. Um, I think if you want to move forward in spirituality, I think there are many opportunities. I would encourage people to really sort of go out and have a go and try different things without preconceived ideas. Um, I think that you would perhaps find God in a forest as much as you would find God in a Catholic church, in a you know Gothic building. I think because they're all part of creation, they're all part of the world around us. You know, they're all universally connected one way or another. They're just different facets. But it's so, so much easier, like in the way of the weird, there's so, so much easier to start with that which is before you, that which is immediately in front of you. Because, uh, well, if, if you have the whole world, which we have now, we've got the internet, if you have the entire world, your first instinct is to sit there and just go blank and think, where the heck do I start? You know, there's so much now that to start is, is to get off the starting blocks is actually a lot harder than, say, it was in the 70s and 80s when this book was written. This book is a good starting point for anybody in the West because it does give you um, the tools you need to know where to go. Um, if somebody came up to me and said, well, you know, where do I start? I wouldn't say, oh, you know, dash off and read the Book of the Dead from Egypt. Because, uh, th- it just wouldn't work, you know. They'd, they'd, they'd perhaps enjoy it, they'd perhaps get something out of it, but they're not going to come away feeling sort of magically experienced as a result of reading something like that. On the other hand, there are other books, there's uh, things you can dip into that are more relevant to where we're at in, in this society here in the West. I would say, you know, go for something that's, that's, that's more appropriate. Mark, as we begin to draw things to a close for today, I remember I mentioned earlier I was quite young when I read The Way of Weird, and it was around that time that I also started reading about quantum physics. Oh, and yeah. The two, the two things, I remember drawing parallels in different things I was reading at the time, not just those two subjects, but um, others, with regard to the concept of there being other levels of reality that are not immediately accessible to our five senses. Yeah. And there's a great bit in The Way of Weird where there's the possibility of becoming injured in a dream is very real. We talked earlier about a fundamental field or force behind everything, and cutting-edge physics kind of has been suggesting this for a long time that whether we can actually get to something fundamental or not, there is a background level or levels to this reality that, you know, the more we drill down, then the more is revealed to us, um, or actually not. But that either way, we know that what we're looking at, what we're experiencing with our five senses, isn't the, the, the fundamental nature of reality. And um, that, again, goes back to the things we talked about earlier in, in, in myths and um, spiritual traditions. Uh, the world over speak about the basic same concept you know, that there's something on underlying reality. And I, for me, this, I reread the book actually in preparation for this interview. And I thought it was very instructive to do so after such a long period of time in between. And it came back yet again. This is one of the things that I really took away from it. There's more to the world than meets the eye is probably the simplest cliche you can use to sum it <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, science generally now is proving that the, the, well, there is. Everything from the first discoveries of the animals that see in different light spectrums. I mean, that, those discoveries have been known for quite a while that, you know, bats use ultrasound and, uh, you know, uh, cats can see things that humans can't, so can dogs. Um, so straight away, light, uh, you know, enables other creatures to experience the world in ways that we don't. Which then, of course, leads on to the obvious question. Well, OK, if we can't see so much of that, wavelength so much of the energy that's around us if we can't see it then what exists within that energy um people probably since the 60s and 70s uh, have been asking the question can we use that energy can we use that energy to actually create physical things occurring you know um a dream state if you were in a dream state you know how much can we then create our own reality it's a real strong question that probably since the days of the alchemists 
they've been fighting with this idea of what is reality. Um, you know, what do we do um, to affect the world around us? Um, and it's true, because if you're happy, the world around you seems to be positive, things seem to work, and you attract that. If you're negative, the world seems to turn against you, and it goes horribly wrong, and you're carrying huge burdens. Um, you've even got these people that walk in and just drain all the energy out of the room, uh, almost like a psychic vampire. It's almost like theft. They're sort of stealing the energy out of everything. Um, so it's quite obvious that people do affect, in really, really significant ways, the physical world around them. So the way of weird, I think, just pushes that envelope. It, it pushes it right as far as it can possibly go. Um, but it's been pushed, like you say, by other cultures in other ways. Even in the Arthurian legends, um, characters have dreams and wake up in the physical world with the consequences of those dreams. So there is this kind of crossover. Um, you know, the mind, the senses, the, who and what we are, that is just beginning to open up to us now. Science is just beginning to sort of plumb into those areas and look at things that, that are changing our view of the universe and the way we look look at the, the world around us. Uh, so things are changing. They really are. Um, magic, on the other hand, would just say, hey, you know, we knew it all along. You know, the, this this is not new information to us. Science is merely showing us how those things are possible. Um, but they're probably still possible, you know. Um, as you say, I think at the turn of the tw 21st century, where we are now, so many m more years down the line since uh, Brian wrote his book, uh, where we are now, things are really actually beginning to change. Uh, the dissemination of that knowledge across the internet is is taking us to places that, when the book was written in 1983, uh, obviously that wasn't, possible there weren't things around then that we have available to us now so i actually think there is something in that i i think we will go on to discover that a lot of the things in the past that were regarded as shamanism and magic and you know mythology a lot of it will actually find itself a place to settle in fact and i think that's coming i really do well just a final <laughs> thought from me mark um towards the end of the book um, there's a lovely quote which I, I really, really liked. Uh, it's when the, the two main characters have gained this mutual understanding and mutual appreciation of, you know, where each is coming from. And this reflects the synthesis that you were referring to a few moments ago. And Brand, the monk, says to Wolf the Shaman, reflecting back on the experience that he's had, I am a servant of Almighty God, but it is in the world of weird that I experienced his wonder. I, I just love that because that that says so much in just one little line. It, it it does. It does. No matter what we think might be out there, no matter what gods and goddesses with a capital or a small g we think are out there, it comes back to our experience. So that really does perhaps hit the nail on the head. Now, at this stage, uh, Mark, before signing off, I normally like to share websites. As far as the book The Way of Weird is concerned, for the longest time, there was a The Way of Weird website, and that recently appears to be down. That was quite a good resource. For listeners, I will just say I discovered another one, thewayofthebuzzard.co.uk, which has a whole section devoted to the wisdom of The Way of Weird. And just to remind listeners once again, we've been talking about The Way of Weird, Tales of an Anglo-Saxon Sorcerer the 1983 novel by Brian Bates. So having given people that info, if they wish to go and explore, um, just tell them about your own online presence, anything you'd like to put out there, any forthcoming publications. Okay. Um, the best place to find my books is on Amazon and Waterstones. Um, they're published uh, variously by O Books and uh, Kronos Books who are imprints of John Hunt Publishing, so you can go and have a look for those. They're out there. Uh, basically, just type my name in, um, and the books will pop up. Uh, there should be at least three of them. As I said, Dispering Ninth Legion, Revealing the Green Man, and The Life and Times of the Real Robin Hood. Um, if people want to come and see me and what I do at my medieval events during the year, um, we now have two websites which people can go and explore. Uh, one is, all one word, Viking Medieval Markets. If you type that in, Viking Medieval Markets, um, you will get uh, the address for that. And you can go and have a look at that website. Or the other one is mythco.uk, which 
which is mythco, mythco.uk and most of the products that I produce and the people around me produce can be found on that website. So, there you go. Splendid. Well, once again, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.